<laughs> Man, it's, it's, it's so cool. I love it when, you know, it's like you say you can't stop a freight train. Well, you ain't going to stop the Holy Spirit from moving either. And so I, I love it when God's just present and we feel it and we're excited. And so I'm just glad you're here. You know, we're doing this series called Uncommon. And it's a relationship series. And, and the reality is, is that, man, relationships are so important to God. And it's what makes us the community that we are, the church. And if anybody understands how important uncommon relationships are, it's the people of God. It's those who do life with Jesus. In fact, when it comes to the idea of common, there should be nothing common about the relationships that we have because we have this incredible uncommon love that God has shared with us. And that, that's what this series is all about. And there's a lot of common things in this world. In fact, you know, the, we're not drawn to the common, we're drawn to the uncommon, the things that say, wow, I wanna be that, or I wanna experience that. You know, many of you know that I, I journeyed to uh, Ecuador this last year to uh, kind of check out some areas where we possibly do another church plant in the future. And, and while I was there, I got introduced to Ecuadorian chocolate. Now, I don't know if you've ever had Ecuadorian chocolate, but it is uncommonly good and delicious. Right? It's like, it's something about when it grows in that region, it has a, just a nuttier flavor and a kind of fruitier flavor. And man, I'd love to have given you guys a sample, but I ate it all, so you can't. But just take my word, it is uncommonly good. And see, we're drawn to the uncommon. And when we see things that are uncommon, we want that. And again, that's why we're doing this series. Because God wants to use something unique about the community of his people, the church, to draw people to something uncommon in their lives. And in fact, when we break it down to our individual relationships, God wants us to have uncommon relationships in our homes, our marriages, our families, with our siblings, with our parents, with our children. He wants us to have uncommon relationships in our workplaces with those that are different from us, with those that, that, that man, are difficult perhaps to work with. He wants us to have uncommon relationships in the church where, yeah, the reality of, of life hits the church too. And, and he wants us to have relationships that are just uncommon and change. In fact, as we've learned through this series, uh, if you want to follow along on your outlines, pull those out. Man, to have uncommon relationships, we have to do uncommon things. We really do. In fact, uh, many of you know that our student ministries is on its winter retreat this weekend. And, and some of you, hopefully you didn't discover that just today when you showed up. But that's where our students are. And, and, and some of our students watch children. And so, uh, again, they're forming uncommon relationships up there. And we want to keep them in prayer. And, and uh, I think they're coming home this afternoon. I, I know God did some incredible things up there. Because we have to do uncommon things to experience that. And so week one, we kick this off with the idea of uncommon commitment. It's found and formed in unconditional love that God showed us. Uh, last week, Michael Baggett, who is, uh, Baggett, who is also uh, bringing the, the Bridges Singles Ministry, who, is, by the way, is having a, a meet and greet after this service, uh, after the last service. If you guys want to check that out, check out his ministry. It's good. You can go there. He spoke to us about uncommon uh, confidence, about trust, and how trust is important to uncommon relationships. And today we're going to talk about this idea of uncommon connection. It's so because connection in a relationship is so important. And, and the stronger the connection, the better the relationship and the, the deeper the relationship. And it's really important that you and I make, uh, un have uncommon connections because it's that con uncommon connection that keeps us connected for a lifetime. And there's a good chance that the, the people that we have the deepest connections with are individuals that we formed connect connections in the, a long time ago. And they've just gotten deeper and deeper and stronger and stronger. And they're our best friends. And perhaps some of us married those individuals. And see, we, when it comes to the idea of connection, we always talk about when a, a relationship's formed, we say, man, that was a good connection. And you had something in common or you did something and you said, man, we made a connection. And in fact, remember the television like a game show, Love Connection, back in the 90s? Right? Chuck Woolery, you know, he's like two and two, you know, he's like that guy. And he, he, he talked about, it was like the idea of a love connection. And they had this like, kind of a dating game where uh, someone would choose someone to go out on a date with, and they would go on a date, and they'd come back and explain how it went. And if they made a love connection, then they would win, and they'd go on a trip or something like that. And it's fascinating because, you know, think about, yeah, that, that's, that's how it works. You just make a connection, everything's good, right? Not necessarily. Connections are hard. In fact, Chuck Woolery, which he said, that out of the 2,120 episodes that he did, it produced only 29 marriages, 8 engagements, and 15 children. Now, I'm not sure if the children came before or after the marriage. I, you know, I'm not sure there. But again, you think about that. Of all those shows and all the contestants, only 29 made a real connection. And he said, connections are hard. And, and a good connection is so important to start on and build on. In fact, there's so many things that you and I can make connections on with people. And we can connect over physical things, things that we like to do, things that we like to you know, participate in. And, and if someone has something in common, we say, yeah, I made a connection. 
We can connect in social ways, places we like to go, people we like to hang out with. And when we have common things in, 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 things in common, we say, that was a connection. We can connect over things that uh, stimulate our emotions, like music, or our books, or movies. And, and, and we have shared those common interests. We, ah, I made a connection. And the Bible talks about the deepest form of connection is in a spiritual way. It's when we connect with someone over the way that we choose to allow our life to be formed and our beliefs to form the way we live. And when we connect at that level, it's, it's deep. It's the deepest form of connection, one God desires for all of us in every relationship. In fact, that's why the Bible says, like, when it comes to those you're really investing in those connections in, don't be unequally yoked. Don't be influenced outside of their very beliefs and cores of who we are. So that's how important connection is to God. In fact, when it comes to this idea of connection, establishing a good connection, it sounds easy, but it's not. Sometimes I think it's easier wiring up my surround sound system, and I really don't even know how I figure that one out. Just don't push that one button because I lost it, right? We understand it's a difficult thing. And I believe there's two very common challenges to us making uncommon connections. I'm going to talk about those this morning. They're not bad things. In fact, they're good things, but they just create challenges. And the first one there on your outline is it's, it's, it's hard to make, it's a, it's a challenge to have uncommon connections because we all have unique wiring. Every one of us is wired differently. God chose to wire us the way he chose us, and it was by his design, and he wired us all differently. King David recognized that, and look what he said in Psalm 139, 14. He says, thank you, God, for making me so wonderfully complex. <laughs> Your workmanship is marvelous. How well I know it. And David's realizing, man, he's like, I love the fact that you wired me. I'm still trying to figure it out, God, but, but I love the way you wired me. I love the, the way that you've affirmed me and who I am. And see, God has wired us all differently, and it's a good thing. I mean, could you imagine if we had all the same interests and all the same likes? If everybody in the world's favorite color was purple and our favorite food was tofu? I mean, could you imagine a world like that? How boring that would be. See, but God knew that there's beauty in contrast. There's something incredible out of creation that when things are in contrast, it brings about colors and shades and hues and beauty in our lives and everything around us. See, that's why God created us differently. In fact, we need to learn to understand those differences. So I'm going to do a little hand raise survey here, okay? I'm going to ask you to raise your hand if you identify with one of these traits, right? So first of all, let's hear it for, or hear, see the hands of those who are the introverts in the room. Introverts are individuals who's gained their energy from being alone and isolated, okay? All right, not too many introverts here this morning. All right, but it's okay, all right? How about the extroverts, those who gain energy about being around other people? Okay, I'm going to ask for full participation here, people. All right? All right? Let's try this one over. Introverts. All right. Extroverts. All right. See? It's, it's, it's unique. It's 50-50 split. All right? I'm going to ask, how many morning people in the crowd? Morning people? Let's hear it. All right. Good. How many night owls in the crowd? All right. Oh, cool. All right. See? Difference. All right. How about this? How about the salty people in the room? Not, not the people who are salty, but people who like salty things, right? All right? Sweet people in the room, right? Okay. Good. Yeah. And... Salty, sweet, sure. Mix them together. I'll eat them both, right? It's like, no problem. How about air conditioning full blast? Heated blanket? You know, right? Okay, yeah. See, see, it's, we're all different. And we can laugh about it. And it's good. And, and yet, the differences causes challenges at times. You know, it's something about the opposite of tract. And, and the idea is that we're supposed to form the connection. But sometimes it, it creates a disconnect. First, we have to work through that. Often when people get married, they find out one's a piler and the other one's a filer, right? One's a stacker, the other's a packer, right? It's like it creates these unique tensions in relationships that you have to work through and it's hard to make the connection because of those differences. But that's why we have to learn to embrace them. And in fact, why it's so difficult in differences is because someone will do something and will say, well, why'd you do it like that? And it's simply because we wouldn't have done it like that. But it doesn't mean it was wrong the way they did it. And see, it brings a tension that we just have to recognize. In fact, when it comes to the differences, there's many different types of under, ways to understand the differences. In fact, personality profiles are a huge thing. And there's many different ways to do it. But Myers-Briggs is probably the one that most people identify with. And maybe you've taken a Myers-Briggs test. And, and it, it, it helps understand that, the, that, or it's identified, that there are 16 different personality traits that people have. And, and when it comes to the idea that 16 different ones, you're going to have a personality trait that's going to be different than most likely 15 other people. And, and, and because of that, it's important that you understand that. In fact, I've got a, a website on your outline there, 16personalities.com. I'd encourage you, if you've never done that or even if you've done it, do it again. Take 10 to 15 minutes to take this little survey. It's going to ask you some questions about who you are, and it's going to give you a profile. 
and then take another 10 to 15 minutes and read about how you're wired, why you are the way you are, and learn to embrace yourself for the way that you're wired, your wonderfully complex self. Embrace it. And yet, as you read, what you're going to discover, too, is how you interact with those who are different from you and how it can better understand. See, because the key isn't just embracing the way we're wired. It's learning to accept and embrace the way other people are wired, the way God chose to embrace them. It's one of the ways over the challenges. And, and which gets to the next challenge of connection, and it's this one, that we are all wired to survive. You and I were all wired to survive and pursue life. God chose to, to wire us in a manner that we, we, we were to be self-sustaining and to live. God created each of us, our heart, mind, body, soul, to thrive on life. And that's why we have hunger pains, because the body needs fuel, body needs food. And so we hear these hunger pains come up and we eat because we know we need to eat to live. We get tired at the end of the day and then we know we need sleep and so we shut down and we lay down, right? We see danger and we want to survive so we run the other way. <laughs> it's like we are wired to survive. In fact, we, none of us had to learn that. It's not a learned trait. It was one that God wired within us because you think about what children's first words are, right? Mommy and daddy and mine, right? It's like, we didn't have to teach them that word. They learned that one all on their own, right? And see, it's, it's not necessarily a bad thing that we're wired to survive. It can sometimes be couched in selfishness. See, because, because we're wired to survive, we think about ourselves first. We think about the needs that we have and we want those needs met. And that's not necessarily a bad thing unless you overlook the needs of others. See, and that's why God reminds us in his word that he, he's reminded us to learn to love others as we love ourselves. And it's a balance there. In fact, that's why we're reminded in Philippians 2, 3. It says, don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble. Thinking of others as better than yourselves. See, because we're always going to think of ourselves first. So the challenge is, how can I think of others first and then myself? And see, that, that's the challenges of this. And in fact, there's something in the computer world called system compatibility that I think is relevant to our discussion. Now, I'm not a computer expert, and I'm sure someone in this room is going to correct me afterwards. And it's okay, afterwards you can tell me all, everything I said wrong. But when it comes to the idea of co uh, system compatibility, it's when two separate systems are trying to communicate with each other. Right? The definition is two separate systems trying to work together while at the same time remaining unaffected by the other system. Sounds like a marriage. Right? <laughs> uh, but the idea is that if they don't have compatibility, they can't work it out. It's why Macs and Windows don't like each other. They don't work together because they don't have system compatibility. And see, in relationships, we often claim, oh, we just don't have compatibility. Yeah, I was married, but just uh, it didn't work out. We're just too different and it didn't work. Uh, that person at work, man, they're just weird, different. You know, it's like it didn't work out and I couldn't work in their department. And so I had to move. Well, see, the problem with that is that God said that, no, 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 no. I've given everybody system compatibility. I've given everybody in this room and everybody who you interact with the ability to work it out and make the connection. And the, the answer is love. See, love is what system compatibility is all about between people and relationships. In fact, uncommon love is what produces uncommon connection. It really does. That's why Jesus told us, and I think we've said it every week. Here. Hey, Jesus said, they will know that you're doing life with me. They will know that you are my disciples by your love. Because of the way you love, because of the connections that are formed, because you love, that's how you'll know that you're doing life with me. That's how important relationships are to God. And in fact, the Bible has a lot to say about love. In a moment, we're going to look at a chapter in 1 Corinthians 13, a letter that Paul wrote to the church in Corinth. And it's known as the love chapter, and you're probably familiar with it. We're going to read it. But as I was doing my study and I started thinking, well, why did Paul write that? Why, why was he writing about love? I mean, we love it. We read it at weddings. We read it all the time. But why was he talking about it? In fact, the reason that he wrote Corinthians is he's talked about the overwhelming or overarching um, theme is community. How important the community of God is. Like, if anybody understands relationship, it should be the church. He says, so work really hard at community. Work really hard at loving each other. And, and that's like the essence of it. In fact, in chapter 12, right before he gets to this, con this discussion on love, he compares the church to a body. And he kind of brings up this idea of system compatibility. He says, you know, like, like a body has many parts and many organs, and, and they all have to work together. And if they don't work together, they're sick and unhealthy. But if it works together, and you can get along, and you accept each other, then you'll thrive at life. You'll thrive at being the church. 
And he describes that and he expresses that. In fact, I'd encourage you, read chapter 12 of 1 Corinthians next week sometime. And, and he's saying that not only is it important in the church, but when the church gets this, the natural outgrowth is healthier families and healthier marriages and healthier work environments. It's the very thing God wants for us as his people to understand the health of the community, of the church, and then it begins to permeate every, every relationship we have in our life, even out, especially outside the church. Because it's what draws people to this uncommon love is the uncommon connection, the uncommon relationships that those people who do life with Jesus have. And then when, right before he launches into this idea of love, look what he says in 1 Corinthians 12. He's talking about community in the body. He says, and yet I will show you the most excellent way. He basically says, the only way that we're ever going to be committed in relationships and have deep connections is because of this thing that he's about to launch into, love. 1 Corinthians 13, 1. If I speak in the tongues of men or of angels, but do not have love, I'm only a resounding gong or clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but do not have love, I'm nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. And Paul's saying, everything that we hope and desire in this life without love amounts to nothing. And in fact, a couple of thoughts there. He says, I'm just, if I don't have love, I'm just making noise. And you know what kind of noise he's talking about? is the annoying noise, right? It's like that, tang, tang, tang. You know, like that's our lives. It's like, it just annoys people without love. It doesn't settle anything. And he goes on, he says, without love, who I am, it amounts to nothing. Who I'm wired to be, what God wants for me, all the purposes of my life, without love, it amounts to nothing. It will never accomplish the things that God wants. In fact, he says, all my efforts change nothing. All, all my efforts, everything I, I, I hope to accomplish in my home, in my work, in my marriage, wherever, it, it changed nothing without love. And Paul is basically saying, man, love is that important to this deal. And then he goes on and he describes what that love looks like in action. Look at Corinthians 13, 4. He says, love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It's not easily angered. It keeps no records of wrong. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. Oh man, I look at that. It's amazing. But you know what that tells me? Love is hard. Love is really, really hard, man. I mean, patient? I don't want to be patient. I want my needs met now, right? I, I don't want to wait for that. Love is kind? Well, yeah, okay, but, but I still want to demand, right? It's like love is, doesn't envy. Well, I look at what they have and that's what I want. But when I do that, I overlook the very things that I have and I don't cherish the very love that God has given me. And we can walk through this and it'd be a great exercise. But ultimately what I believe Paul is telling us about love is love is the constant effort in a relationship to continue the relationship for the purpose of continuing the relationship. Because if we don't continue to love, if we don't give constant effort to love, we quit. We give up. We stop the very thing that God says, I came, lived, and died for. And say, I'm so thankful that God didn't do that. I'm so thankful that God didn't give up on me and give up on us in spite of the conditions of our life, in spite of the challenges we have. He said, no, I'm never giving give up because love never gives up. Love never fails. And see, that's the challenge of this whole thing. In fact, in, I look at the relationships in my life, and there's been many relationships that have been challenging. Friendships, neighbors, work environments, even my marriage at times. And in every one of those, I've been tempted to give up. I don't know how to go forward. I don't know what to do. And yet, because I knew this uncommon love, this unconditional love that came from this God who loved me, I knew I couldn't give up loving. And because I chose to love, even when it was the most difficult, just to keep effort of loving, loving, God has brought healing and restoration in those relationships. In fact, next week when we gather again, we're going to talk about an uncommon communication because we have conflicts in relationships. And the only way through those conflicts is to communicate and seek understanding and healing. And sometimes it takes forgiveness, giving and receiving in relationships. And so as we, again, wrap this up today, 
And I, again, I think the, the important part about making connections, it's only found in love. And so here's what I want you to do. I'm going to kind of change this up, shift gears, try to give something practical that we can take from this place today. And I want you to do this. I want you to think of someone in your life who you want to strengthen a connection with, maybe even form a connection with. Maybe it's someone, your spouse, maybe you're married to, maybe it's someone you're dating and pursuing a relationship with, and you want to strengthen that connection. Maybe it's someone you live with right now. Maybe it's a child or, or a sibling or a parent. It's a little strain right now, and you want to deepen that connection. Maybe it's someone in the workplace, someone who's challenging you, someone who you're challenged by. And, and, and again, I, I would encourage you to think of that person, right? And I want to go into this understanding of, of love languages. Uh, a while ago, uh, a pastor by the name of Gary Chapman wrote this book called The Five Love Languages. You may have heard about it. It's a great thing. In fact, I would encourage you to look into it. Uh, FiveLoveLanguages.com there. Check it out. So Gary Chapman developed that these five love languages that he believed everyone speaks. And he believes that every one of us has a primary and a secondary love language when it comes to these love languages. And he, he says that when it comes to our love languages, we, part, we speak our love language more than we receive other love languages. It's like a language. And again, when he says that, he says, well, if we can understand these love languages, he says, deeper relationships will happen. In fact, he compares it. it the, the first time he wrote the book, it was about married couples. But there's like seven editions about parent love languages, sibling love languages, workplace love languages. And, and psychologists have agreed. These, are, these love languages, they work. They're really true. And, and so it's amazing to study. So I just want to look at these five real quick. And, and I'm going to ask you to try to identify where you're at, right? Maybe you've heard about them. Maybe you've done it before, but it's always a good refresher. Love language number one is words of affirmation. Words of affirmation are simply words that we receive that are spoken to us that make us feel loved. Things like, wow, you look really good today. You know, oh man, that was an amazing meal. You're an amazing cook. Ha, you always make me laugh, right? Dustin, your music's rocking, right? It's like, it's saying those things. It's affirming someone with the words that we speak. And if you have the love language of words of affirmation, you know that when someone appreciates you, affirms you, you feel loved. You feel loved. Number two, quality time. Quality time is giving someone else your undivided attention. Undivided means soul attention. <laughs> so quality time isn't necessarily sitting on the couch watching TV together, although that might work as long as it's the movie they wanted to watch. Right? Uh, no, quality time is being with another person doing something together. Quality time is going on a walk. It's experiencing things together, the emotions of the, th the experiences together. And if you have the love language of quality time, you know that just being with the person that you desire to have a connection with and them willing to do that, you feel loved. Love language number three, receiving gifts. Now again, when it comes to the idea of, of giving love, it's, it's always giving something. But receiving gifts, it's not a superficial thing. It's the idea that someone has tangibly given you something because they love you. And, and again, it's, it's not necessarily what they spend or things like that. It's that they thought of you when you weren't around. And you were not around. Oh, man, that'll be good for them. And they buy it and they give it to you because you were thinking of them. And if you have the love language of receiving gifts, you realize and you feel love when someone was thinking of you or presented something to you that would benefit your life in some way. Number four, acts of service. This one's pretty easy. <laughs> it's when someone does something for you, right? It's when someone says, because they love you, they just do something for you. They wash your clothes. They empty the dishwasher. They clean the cat box. They change the diaper. They wash your car, right? It's like, it's the things they do without having you to ask. That's the key right there, right? It's like you just do them because you love them. And if you have the love language of acts of service, you feel loved when someone does something for you. And then the last love language is physical touch. And if you under, have the love language of physical touch, you know how empowering it is when someone reaches out and grabs your hand or gives you a hug. In fact, that's my number one love language. And it is nothing more powerful than my wife comes up to me when we're walking and she grabs my arm and just leans into me. Man, I just have a rush of just this satisfaction and love and security because that's my love language. And so I want you to look at the list. Go back. And I want you to, to rate yourself. Give yourself a one for what you think is your number one love language and a two for the secondary love language that you, you wish you had, all right? Okay, so look at the list, figure it out. Now, now, you might be sitting there and going, hey, Mike, I've got all five. I was like, well, good for you. You're just gonna be hard to love, that's all. It's like, right? it's like but you can do that. It, there's no rules, right? It's like, but identify a primary and a secondary. And now what I want you to do is, remember that person I asked you to think about earlier? I want you to look at this list and I want you to figure out. In fact, you may have an assignment this week. 
figure out what their love language is. How do they speak? How do they communicate? See, because the key here is to uncommon connection is to communicate more in love language of others than your own. So you're going to communicate in your own all the time. And there's individuals, I don't know why I love them. I buy them everything. I do everything for them. Well, what if their love language is physical touch, quality time? And guess what? Lost in translation. Lost in translation. See, and, and Gary Smalley talks about this thing in the context of marriage, but I think it's universal. He says, when you love someone in their language, you actually make deposits into like this love account that they have, like a bank account. You make deposit after deposit after deposit, and it's going to rise, 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 rise. But then we're going to do things, you know, like rub them the wrong way, <laughs> be short, and guess what happens? Instead of making a deposit, we're going to make a withdrawal. <laughs> and a withdrawal. He says, the challenge is make sure you're making more deposits than withdrawals. And when you do, your love tank's full. And see, so let me give you this today as we wrap this up. Let me, let me give you an assignment. This week, practice the language of others more than your own. Don't worry about getting your needs met. Trust that when you fill someone else's tank, eventually they'll begin to fill yours. That's how it works. And again, when you find it struggling to love, just lean back into Jesus, who modeled every love language to us perfect, who left everything to show us his great love. And when we anchor into that, we're well on our way. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you again for the opportunity to pursue your word and your truth and the opportunity we have, God, to form great connections and relationships. God, this week, may we all try to communicate better in the other love language, those that we love, those that we want to make connection with, and, and, and do our best, God. And so by doing that, Lord, to watch what you can do when we choose to love, when we make every effort to love, God, may we, may we experience the very thing that we desire because that's what you promise us. And God, when we come back next week, God, help us uh, to hear how you can bring healing when we trust you by seeking understanding in all relationships. Jesus, we pray. Amen.